Welcome. Um, I hope you all have a lot of energy within you. How long did you queue to get into the, <laughs> the parliament? If you queued for more than 30 minutes and found this room, once again, pat yourself, give yourself a clap. Um, this really show intent. So my name is uh, Pina or Giuseppina. Um, for those of you who uh, want to call me by my full name and you are not my mother. Um, I am coming from an organization that's called uh, OBESU, which is the Organizing Bureau of European School Student Unions. And I also work with the European Apprentices Network and I will be your moderator today. Of course, there's many people here behind me. I will introduce them in a second. And we also want to know something about you. But first, let me go through some housekeeping rules. So, once again, um, the European Youth Event is a safe space. So you all have received the code of conduct. Please make sure that you always make everyone feel comfortable and that we're all in a safe space. So please don't forget to respect the code of conduct uh, um, and think twice <laughs> before saying something that you think does not align with the code of conduct. Um, in the principles of this event, of course, is the European Youth Event. It's all about youth voice, your voice, our voice matters. And uh, these events are all about participation. So if there's a chance to speak up and you want to speak up, please take the floor, take the time and let us know uh, your thoughts and uh, actively participate to take the most out of today. Some smaller announcements. There uh, is a camera that is recording the session that will be available on the website of DG Employment of European uh, Commission on the YouTube channel. If you do not wish to appear in it, do not sit in front of it. Um, if you do not mind, it's mainly taking your back. So it's over there, you can see it. Um, make sure you, you know where it is. Um, a little bit about today's event. So today's event is about green excellence for a sustainable future. Uh, what is green excellence for a sustainable future? We're gonna discuss it today with the people in the panel. Um, we're gonna discuss the importance of skills and skills development um, in the transition, in the green transition, in making sure we live in a better world and we, we live in a sustainable planet and we make sure that our present and our future are more sustainable. Who are we gonna do it with? So we have with us today um, Melanie Henke from the three LOE Erasmus Plus Center of Vocational Excellence. We have Maria Apsata from the Fashion Earth Alliance Erasmus Plus Center of Vocational Excellence. We have uh, Martin Schmidt from Euro Apprentices. And we have Anna Barbieri from Directorate General Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion of the European Commission. And of course, you have me, you're stuck with me for an hour, ha ha ha. Um, your moderator um, <laughs> trying to make the most out of today. Um, now, we, we, I know you all have phones and if you don't, borrow the one on your right or left. And uh, join us on this uh, Slido to also know a little bit about you. Tell us where are you coming from? Uh, Tell us, tell us. We're gonna use Slido for the whole duration of today's session, so please make sure to stay onto the link. Um, use another tab for Albania, Croatia, Sweden, Germany, Germany, more Germany, the Netherlands, the Netherlands, Germany, Turkey, Greece, Spain, Croatia, Turkey, Germany, Italy, Spain. Ah, so many people from Turkey, Turkey, Turkey. Who is here from Turkey? Raise your hands. Oh, wow. Hi, 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 hi. <laughs> Ooh, la, 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 la. Ooh, la, 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 la. Germany, you're leading in second. Where are you? Germany. Wow, Germany. Ah, ah you're scattered, but you are here. You're here. Uh, Italy, where are you? Ah, ah, ah. Good, good, good. Now I have you. Spain. We've got. Hello, Spain. Hello. We've got Australia. Who is here from Australia? Hello. Um, we've got England, Austria. Raise it, raise it. Do something that you would do in your home country. Uh, Belgium, uh, ah, my adoptive country. Hello. Um, Hungary, France. Okay, voila. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of people, so hopefully you get to meet uh, some of them throughout today. 
and um, you get to speak to each other even when you leave this session hopefully go walk hand in hand with someone from Turkey because there is a lot of them you know <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's the wisest thing you can do um, now I before we start the, the panel and the discussion I'm gonna turn to Anna Anna you've been working on uh, on vocational education and training Erasmus plus for 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 a while can you help us set the scene a little bit. What are we doing here? What are we talking about? Yes, yeah, sure, with uh, big pleasure. Um, good afternoon, hello everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today in this session on green uh, excellence. Uh, the event today is part of the European Year of Skills. So we launched uh, in uh, May a European Year of Skills because we want to ensure that everybody is aware of the importance of skills and in particular for the session today, the importance of developing green skills for sustainable future. Uh, I would like uh, to introduce a bit the topic of today and I will use uh, four keywords. My first keyword is Erasmus Plus, then I have vocational education and training, then apprenticeships, and then excellence. So the first one is Erasmus Plus. Erasmus Plus is the European program for uh, education, training, youth and sport. It is a program that allows millions of uh, people to have a learning experience uh, abroad, an exchange for studying, for training, for volunteering, and it also uh, finance thousands of projects, of cooperation projects every year among organizations from all over Europe and beyond also. But before I go further, I would like to ask you a question without Slido this time, just if you can raise your hand, if you have had a mobility experience abroad, or if you know someone that has participated in Erasmus Plus. Can you raise your hand, please? We want to see a little bit. Wow, this is, uh, this is uh, quite amazing. So for those uh, that uh, didn't raise their hand now, I really hope for you that in the future you can take advantage of the opportunities that Erasmus Plus uh, offers. And for those that raise their hands, congratulations, you are part uh, of the Erasmus Plus uh, generation. Um, oh, sorry. No, still there. Um, Erasmus Plus has among its objectives to promote uh, social inclusion, green skills, digital skills, and also active citizenship uh, participation, active participation in society. Uh, sometimes people think that Erasmus Plus uh, is only for higher education, for universities, but actually Erasmus Plus is for all sectors of education. So also for secondary general schools, it's also for vocational education and training, and also for apprenticeships. And now for those that might not know some of the words that uh, Pina and I have used now, I would like to clarify, when we speak about vocational education and training, this is a, a, one of the broadest sectors of education. It is the one that is providing the skills for the labor market, for a specific occupation. Um, so it is actually, uh, with a, with a, um, often with a practical aspect, so a practical part of the training. And we used to say actually that uh, there are as many vocational education and training systems in Europe as there are countries, because it is very, very varied. Before the session, we were discussing among ourselves and we were saying, is that really vocational education and training, etc.? So really there, are, there is a variety, but what you need to know is that it is the skills for the labor market. 
At European level, we are also promoting practical training because we think that when you learn theoretical things in school, it's also very good if you also practice them, they stick much better. And one of the types of practical training that exists, it's part of the vocational education and training variety, it's apprenticeships. So it is the type of program, educational program, that combines learning the theory in a school with learning part of the skills and putting them in practice in a working environment. And this is kind of balanced, like 50-50 theory, 50 theory and 50 practice, just so that you can have a bit uh, a, an idea of what are the things that uh, the speakers will be saying uh, afterwards. Um, there is be the, um, around the Erasmus Plus, there are not only the possibility of learning mobility, but also cooperation projects, so organizations that work together. And one good example of projects in, in Erasmus Plus are the centers of vocational excellence. And this word has given us the inspiration to call this session Green Excellence, the one of today. What are these projects? They uh, support and create training centers that are very innovative, that they help to provide the skills that are relevant for the labor market. They bring together a variety of uh, partners from companies, from education, from public authorities, and they work together to develop skills, but also to promote uh, the um, regional development from the regions from, all, from where all the partners come from. Every year we fund uh, around 15 projects uh, for four years and for a budget of 4 million euros. Then I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I would like to say, well, for green excellence, I'm told that I have to finish perfectly in time. For green excellence, we need the uh, efforts of everybody, but not individually. We also need to join forces. And the speakers that will speak after me will explain how the four keywords that I told you about Erasmus Plus, vocational training, apprenticeships, and excellence are contributing to green excellence, the topic of today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And as you heard, I have a duck. I hope you heard it. If you don't, my, the duck is my secret weapon. I use it um, at my discretion. And I turn now to Melanie. Melanie, tell us a little bit about you. Who are you? Why are you here? Yes, thank you, Pina. And thank you for the organizers for giving me the floor to speak here today. Uh, my name is Melanie. I am from Lithuania and from Germany and I'm 29 years old. I work at an NGO called the Hanse Parliament in Hamburg, in Germany. And the Hanse Parliament is a nonprofit organization for the support of um, small and medium-sized enterprises. And how we do that? Well, we want to make sure that there are enough skilled workers to work in these small and medium-sized enterprises in the future and that they have the right skills, so green skills, digital skills, and so on. And we do that mainly through European-funded projects. At the moment, we are running, I think, 13, uh, we are involved in 13 projects. We are leading seven of these EU-funded projects, and one of them is 3LOE. That's the short name for the project. The long name you can see on the slide is Three Level Centers of Vocational Excellence on the Green Economy. So you heard a bit um, from, from Anna uh, what, what that means, and I will be happy to tell you more about this today. Thank you, Melanie. Maybe you can already dive into, I'm sure many people are wondering what's a 3LOE, and maybe you can actually start giving us a concrete example of what a center of vocational excellence is. Now, with, with the centers of vocational excellence, we're, deli we're trying to propose, you know, like saying uh, that we're finally finding one of the possible ways to change the world. How are you doing that? Yes, thank you. I'm a bit afraid of your duck, so I have some uh, notes here. So I will be looking at my notes to make sure I really get to the, to the point. So um, basically, 3LOE is one of these Erasmus Plus uh, funded projects. It's a four-year project. 
you just heard from Anna that Erasmus Plus is not only where we go abroad to a university or to another school, but it's also this uh, cooperation between different institutions. So in our case here, it's uh, four years, yeah, around 4 million euro budget, and we have 22 partners in this project. It's a different kind of institutions that partner up here in this project. It's mostly vet schools. We also have some universities and um, colleges. And also what is very important here that we work together closely with company, company representatives. So with chambers of commerce and of crafts, for example. And our focus with 3LOE is um, green economy. So what we mean is we want to transform the learning materials, the trainings that are already happening in these different countries, and we want to make them more green. We want to make them more sustainable. We want them to use uh, sustainable materials, for example. We want to rethink really their uh, way of, of learning and of teaching. So um, basically, we have uh, seven countries in this project. I will go to this slide where you can see in, in, in a short overview um, what, the, what the project is about. So in this project, we have Austria, we have Germany, we have Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Spain. And in each of these countries, there is a, a partnership between institutions, and they create this network that we call Center of Vocational Excellence. So it's this name, it's this network where different institutions come together to, to really reform um, learning activities and uh, yeah, to offer new innovative things of, uh, of how to, to, to learn. Uh, when I say how to learn, well, the target group we're speaking about, it's young people. So young people who start a vocational uh, training, but it's also adults who are already working maybe since many, many years in a company, but they, they need to ha have uh, other skills, they need to reskill and upskill. So that's the two target groups that we have. It's the young people, but also the adults um, in further training. And that's actually where the name comes from, like why the three, so three levels of education. We mean first the initial vocational training, right? So when you finish school and you, you go into a training, that's the first level. But the second level is also the further training, when you're already working and you, you want to upgrade, you want to upskill, so that's the second level. And the third level, we mean here the higher education. So we also want to include universities to become more practical, more focused on practical skills. So that's a big focus in the project also that we want to provide learning activities on the job with the companies. In Germany, where I come from, it's quite common that when we do a training that we also learn in the companies, but that's not the case in, in all the countries. And we want to find ways um, that we not only learn and sit in school and, and learn a theory what to do, but that we go in the companies, we have the practical experience, and um, yeah, and this way also have a smooth entry into the labor market. So, I already said uh, some things. Of course, I didn't look at my notes, so I, I don't know what I already said or not. But um, yeah, to wrap this up, maybe I could continue for hours. But to wrap this up, I think um, that we as the young generation, I also consider myself still as, as the young generation, I think we really have a chance to, to choose a green education right now, to choose a green job to make a change in the world. So I'm really happy to see so many faces coming uh, to this uh, session today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna pause, pause, pause. Um, and maybe because uh, you mentioned some keywords and I thought, I wonder who the people in the room are. So I'm gonna improvise a little bit uh, and, uh, and see a little bit how many of you actually come from vocational education and training or an apprenticeship? Okay. I see one. <laughs> okay. Um, how many of you already have a job? And how many of you are planning to look for a job in the near future? 
Okay. With this, with this in mind, me too, actually, maybe. No, I'm just. Um, <laughs> um, actually, with this in mind, I wanted to turn back to Melanie one, one more time and ask, Melanie, you, you mentioned a little bit your, your, um, you want to transform education and make sure that people have the, the possibility to choose a green job and a green education. But what's a green job? And what, um, what are the, the new jobs for the green economy that you're preparing yourself to? Yes, so first of all, I want to give you a number. So there is this study of the International Labour Organization that estimates that about 100 million new jobs in the green economy will open up by 2030. So if you choose now a green economy um, kind of education field, I'm sure you will find a job, one of these 100 million uh, in the next years. So um, basically, I would say that there's two kind of uh, categories of jobs. Firstly, it's jobs that we make greener. It's not green jobs, so to say, but you know, all kind of jobs in this 3LUE project. Uh, each region has its own thematic focus. So for example, in Poland, it's about, a lot about logistics, how to make uh, logistics more green, how to have supply chains that are more uh, sustainable, how to make them you know, more in, in a circular uh, way. In Latvia, for example, it's a lot about construction. How can we construct houses um, with uh, sustainable material that in the end don't end up as waste but can be reused, for example. In Lithuania, for example, there is a focus on, on um, on the hospitality sector. So for example, restaurants, how can they make sure not to waste so much food? So you see there's all kind of jobs that we can make greener. But then the second category, I think it's really like um, coming up with innovations, with new things that are, you know, completely um, green, so to say, com com completely um, yeah, emission free. So, for example, new ways of, of transport, right? How can we find uh, new ways of transport that are completely, um, completely green? So that's the two big uh, categories. And in this 3LOE project, we have um, a focus on 50 different trainings. That's why it's so hard for me to wrap this up in a short time. But um, yeah, I encourage you to visit our website. It's also on this uh, slide, I think, somewhere. And on this slide, you can also see a photo of, um, of some young people in Poland, actually. And you can also see that there is this cube. It's kind of our mascot, our you know, sustainable printed uh, paper uh, mascot version that we um, yeah, used to, to show somehow physically our project. And if you don't mind, I would like to take a selfie now with this beautiful audience so that I can show my, my project uh, team that I have met all of you today here. So selfie time. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, and uh, I hope this caught a little bit your your interest and started wondering, but what's really a center of vocational excellence, and how can I in any way profit from this wonderful experience? Um, I am sure there are many ways for you to do so, and if you get lost, the people up here and um, the functional mailboxes <laughs> of um, um, of the European Commission, I'm sure they will be happy to answer to any of your questions and also through your, your national agencies and, and working with your network. Throughout these days, I'm sure there will be many chances for you to get to know more about the program, um, to use Erasmus Plus in the fullest of its extent. Um, and now we started already diving a little bit into the first center of vocational excellence and we said, okay, the idea is to make new jobs new green jobs, but also what we've been doing for a long time, make it greener, or make it greener again, because maybe it was green already in the, in the past. And on this, um, I'm gonna move on to another topic that I'm sure many of us are interested in, which is fashion. 
Um, is fashion interesting? Yes, 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 I see your faces. Now I have a question for you by raise of hand, no shame, uh, of course, nobody's going to be judging anyone uh, from, from up here or from down there. How many of you today are wearing second-hand or sustainably sourced clothing? Very well um, uh, said. And how many of you have a clear idea when I say green fashion? What does it mean? What does it mean to you? Do you know, like, if I say green fashion? Yeah, yeah, there are some, quite some people that have an answer. Hopefully, we can match those, those things with what I'm going to ask our next speaker. Um, Maria. Maria, who are you? Hello, are you? Pina. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to ask who is Greek in here because I saw Greece on the screen. Oh, yes, Patrida. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, thank you for uh, the introduction, Pina. Um, I am Maria Psatha. I come from uh, Greece, specifically Crete, from the Technical Institute of uh, Heraklion Chamber. We are a vocational um, center. We belong to Heraklion's chamber. Um, and we are here today as leaders of the COVID project uh, FEAVE. Uh, our FEAVE is uh, the Fashion Earth Alliance project, uh, which is focused all around sustainability in the fashion sector. And uh, why is that? Because the fashion sector, as many of you may know, um, is one of the most polluting sectors uh, globally. So what does uh, FEAVE do what we want to do is create um, uh, centers of excellence uh, that uh, are going to be created uh, by using uh, chambers, uh, business supporting organizations, uh, and all kinds of institutions that can support the transition of the fashion field uh, into what we call uh, a greener uh, fashion and textiles uh, industries. So, um, what our project is trying to do is help benefit all industries in order to be uh, a bit more easier for them to, to accomplish and to, to adapt new and greener practices. Uh, our job is to create that training curricula that is currently missing from uh, all the training and educational institutes uh, regarding fashion. And this will also help new workers um, achieve in the labor market because uh, there are nowadays industries that are actually interested in turning green. But it's not easy for them to find uh, properly trained personnel. And that's something we need to work on. So, uh, Pina, to answer the question that you made to Melanie, we want <laughs> to change the world by changing some habits first. And in order to change the habits of industries, we firstly need to change the habits that we do, that we have, actually, more uh, correctly. What do I mean by that? I mean that if we don't take a step back and step away from fast fashion, uh, chances are that industry, industries are not going to do it either. So let's talk more about green fashion. What is green fashion? Uh, green fashion is a phrase that has many, many definitions. For many of you, green fashion is uh, the practices of uh, industries and, uh, and of um, factories to create uh, clothing and uh, accessories and uh, footwear that are made by sustainable and renewable materials. And that is correct. That is one definition of green fashion. We can use uh, pure cotton, we can use herb, uh, hemp, we can use, uh, I don't know, bamboo or anything uh, in order to create products in a manner that is, uh, is uh, helping to minimize um, the effect uh, on the environment. But uh, for now, as we all understand, these, uh, this approach and these uh, fashion options are a bit expensive. So what is the next thing that we can do as consumers? How can we combine our love for clothing and fashion with our love for the environment? And there's one simple answer. If you cannot buy sustainable, then maybe buy more ethically. How? Choose your clothing more seriously 
do not be a spontaneous buyer. Buy something that you can use for years, that you can keep using 10 years later, 20 years later. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Of course it's possible. Okay, there are styles that never go out of fashion. So maybe we can start shifting to these. So that is green fashion to me. Um, I don't know if many of you have the least impression of how many gallons of water are used in order to create one and only one pair of jeans. Does anyone know? Can you tell us? They're way more. They're over 100. Oh, sorry. Ah, oh, okay. So there are way more. Can we stop doing this? Can we help fashion industries or maybe make them at some point stop hurting the environment as bad? We can all, I believe, think about it a little further. Um, another important thing to note here is that uh, fashion industry and especially in Greece uh, is starting to lose interest. And that is partly because uh, in Greece, people do not have the opportunity to study uh, in the public sector. And that is something impressive, considering that textile industry is one of the most earning ones in Greece. We produce way too much cotton and we do produce too many textiles. It's really a pity that someone cannot study fashion uh, in a public organization nowadays. We need to change that also. And our curricula are planning uh, to be used in those public, uh, public institutions that are going to be created in order for someone to be able to study. Um, to this point, I have to mention that uh, our project is also working on a communicational and a cooperational platform that is going to help people all over Europe to study uh, abroad in fashion if they wish. One can find uh, in our uh, website uh, all the training uh, opportunities uh, all over Europe uh, in case they want to study anywhere else but their own country. And another one, a big plus of this uh, platform is going to be that also businesses can uh, and will be able to find uh, properly trained personnel for their own needs, to cover their own needs. Um, are you going to use the duck on me? Very soon, so I just want okay. to... Okay, okay. What I want to say is that we plan on making the fashion sector uh, more appealing to young people by emphasizing the fact that uh, it is an artistic sector. It is a sector that allows uh, self-expression. It is a sector that allows you to create something in your mind and then see it come to life in many different ways, whether you're a designer and uh, you have the ability to design yourself or maybe think of it and use an illustrator to design it. Uh, whether you're a photographer, a fashion photographer, and you can create uh, such an image that makes a product so appealing to someone and uh, you actually force him to buy. How many of you buy from the internet? Many of you, I believe. Um, there's a new and very, very interesting uh, profession, which is a uh, fashion technologist. Many of you wear smartwatches. It's not just the company that made the, smart the smartwatch that's behind it. It's also someone from the field of fashion, because someone must make it appealing to someone in order for them to put it on the wrist. Um, there are so many interesting professions, and nowadays there are so many interesting technologies that can be used in the fashion sector that uh, I don't see how, if someone has the least knowledge on these, uh, is not going to want to be um, a bit more involved in the fashion sector, whether uh, from a hobby or uh, professionally. So that's it on my behalf. I hope you were interested in our uh, project. Uh, here you can see our website. You can visit it for more information. And you can also, from January and uh, on, use it in order to find our co cooperation platform. Thank you all. It was very nice being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. You took the questions away from me, so now I don't have any follow-up question for you. Um, but uh, of course, you mentioned uh, quite uh, some interesting things, um, and I think you also mentioned some important skills 
to be developed to be able to to work in the in the fashion uh, in the green fashion industry creativity uh, self expression technical skills uh, critical thinking i mean of course uh, how do you say critical consumerism can it be a skill i'm sure we can make it one if it's not one yet um or consuming critically is definitely a, a competence that we need to develop to be able to to implement the, the green economy um so if you were not convinced uh, by the idea of working in green fashion before this i hope I'll, some of you will move towards one center of vocational excellence and some others towards the other um, and that you continue, I mean, it was impressive to see the amount of people who raised their hand, um, that we continue to be, as you said, individually responsible, but also pushing for a big system change um, towards industries to be able to actually achieve uh, more sustainability. Um, we're gonna switch uh, topic uh, once more, because I know you like the change of scenery, and if you don't, now you do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about apprenticeships. I mean, Anna mentioned a little bit of the definition. I mentioned in the beginning that I was part of this European Apprentices Network. Does any of you know an apprentice? How many of you know an apprentice? Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, do you <laughs> Does everybody know what an apprentice does? Do we more or less feel comfortable? If I were to say, if anybody wants to come on their microphone, you are an apprentice if you dot, dot, dot. Yes, please. Um, I think you are an apprentice if you combine theory and practice um, learning okay i'm just waiting for something uh i think the person who is working it might be for free or getting a minimum salary, but it's like practice for the future education that he's getting or she's getting. Like in my country, I know if you don't have experience, but you really want to try, like, I don't know, to do a photography or anything, uh, but you've never done that before, you can apply for jobs like apprentice where you do it for free as a volunteer or you get just like some minimum wage or something like that. Oh, look, I speak with such a high tone that I thought I was oh, with my... Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Bear. Um, yeah, to make sure that they access, uh, they have access to rights, to connect each other, and also to learn from each other. Because as Anna said, we have a big problem in, the, in, in Europe, which is that our systems are so different that mobility is, uh, is a bit harder, but also, you know, recognition of different qualifications, but also generally, in some countries, there is not a specific framework. So we're pushing for that and for representation. Um, and I mentioned one word that I want to maybe hear a little bit more about. Uh, and for this, I'm turning to Martin. Uh, I said mobility. And mobility ticks off maybe a little bit uh, your um, antenna. Um, because Martin, you're coming from Euro Apprentices. It's a network also um, funded by Erasmus Plus. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about you and the network? Yes, um, thank you so much, Josepina, for leading into that. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today and telling you about uh, my most uh, fruitful, um, uh, passionate way in life, I would say, 
um, that has been my um, apprenticeship in professional job learning. I'm Martin Schmidt, and I um, finished my um, apprenticeship as um, an industry industrial technical um, mechatronical technician in uh, 2020 and that has been a dual system and this dual system combines um, a really attractive um, company uh, con contract you're working in and um, at the same time the school aspect where you uh, get your your theories from and um, at the same time as we were already mentioning um, the Erasmus Plus system combines into that really well. And um, that's one of uh, the most important things I'm here today, since uh, I really want to um, motivate you into that system as an apprentice, like um, I was doing. And what I see today is so many people, so many young people uh, get distracted in, in their life choices because um, they they have some, some dreams about going abroad, for example, and they get uh, sidetracked it, uh, thinking they can only do some um, abroad experiences uh, by um, doing uh, university studies. And sometimes that doesn't really lead into anything, and people should um, get into um, a professional apprenticeship instead. Um, and in my opinion, it would it would be such a great choice for those people to um, to be part of that, since um, nothing else can give you um, such an experience as our, for example, the, the German dual system does, where you have um, all those experiences uh, while working at your, your company site. And um, personally, I did two internships uh, while uh, being an apprentice. And I did uh, two beautiful internships, one in England and one uh, on Malta. And I can only tell you it, it helped me so much developing in my uh, technical experience and most of all in my, um, I would say, social skills for just, just being um, a professional um, part of the, the, the labor market where you have to deal with all those new situations all the time. And you have to you have to deal with um, sometimes um, yeah, challenging tasks and um, maybe your ap apprenticeship as general, but especially with the Erasmus Plus um, opportunity to start an internship while um, while working, you can learn so much by going abroad, and you don't need to um, rely on um, studying un university studies and. Um, yeah, that's why I'm here um, and as an Euro apprentice, since uh, we Euro apprentices, we really want to um, motivate and start the enthusiasm for the, um, for the apprenticeship because the U European Union has so many great opportunities for you when you start uh, that learning skills, but even better, um, the apprenticeship because you have um, all the tools you need to easily start into a really great internship and uh, be a, the professional, skilled uh, European that um, we all need in the labor market. Thank you, Martin. And um, actually, this leads me to nicely to my follow-up question. You already mentioned that your, your work experience abroad helped you in your profession, but that generally your apprenticeship an apprenticeship is a great way to, to kickstart your professional career. So my question to you is, how did your apprenticeship help you in your professional in your profession? And also, you, you said you're in mechat mechatronics. And, um, and um, this is not really the first thing that comes into your mind when you say green uh, job. So how did you how do you bring green and sustainability into your industry? Um, see, um, one part of this uh, sustainable aspect is that um, today and especially tomorrow in, in all of those industrial sections, we, we need to take uh, an eye on those uh, sustainable facts. And I guess you heard uh, I have um, high, in, in, high interest of um, seeing people growing up and glowing up into their profession as um, a, an apprentice, for example. And um, for me, uh, I turned my, my hobby into uh, my, let's say, let's say life skill profession. 
because um, I was loving uh, the electronics um, technical side and aspects of repairing stuff so much that I uh, just got into um, an electronics company where I started my apprenticeship. And since ever then, I um, experienced quite a lot of the, the industrial side of uh, being um, a, a, a taught uh, industrial worker and in the in electronics industry. And I really want you to, to mot uh, I really want to motivate you to be mindful open into your skills. And um, um, it makes me kind of sad to see um, people not really opting in those um, opportunities and they got uh, sidetracked and m into misleading uh, choices, for example. And um, personally, I'm now self-employed, uh, working at the electronics industry, doing um, machinery maintenance and repairs. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I saw some, some people really relying, still relying on the need of being able to repair uh, devices, machinery, maybe in Germany or elsewhere. And um, that, that will um, grow over time in the following years as we need to take really care of our resources. And how many times do you know people that um, get frustrated, they have broken devices, and especially in the technology section, you get into contact with broken devices and um, companies try to make it um, harder sometimes to, to really keep an eye on that and being able to uh, fix stuff on your own or even for professionals. And um, maybe you know some examples of that, but... Um, how fruitful is it to really be able to fix something and keep something alive, bringing it back into service and um, having quite a reasonable impact on our in environment? And whatever you, you really burn for, as an example, take that opportunity um, as a professional apprenticeship and go learn, share, um, do something with your skill with your hobby, whatever you burn for, whatever you love, and um, be part of our really respected European career market. That's what I really want to uh, want you to, to take with this event today. Thank you very much, Martin. And now I'm going to, I don't know, actually I'm gonna move away again, if this works, hello. Hello. Ha, ha, hello. Yes, it works. I'm going to move a little bit because it's a bit boring to be here all the time. You know? So you can also move if you want. You can come with me. We go on a walk. Um, and I wanted to maybe open uh, a little bit of a Q&A session. Does any of you have any questions, any remarks, any comments? Ah, hello. Yes, please. So, um, as long as I know, going green is a global thing to do. So, my question is, how do you make these new green fields available for countries outside of the European Union? Very on point, very on point question. I'm going to see if there is any more, so we take two before we... Yes. This isn't very political, but are there any second-hand shops in Strasbourg? It's a very good question. I'm sure there's plenty. I'm going to ask the volunteers and let you know. But, ah, yes? Yeah, so I know the, uh, one. <laughs> good. So if you can wave your hand, the second-hand uh, expert uh, uh, over there uh, can uh, point you at some... Uh, second-hand uh, shops so that you can bring home an emotional piece of clothing that is not new and remem remember yourself of the time you went to the eye and talked about green fashion and then brought home second-hand. So thank you very much. Not very political, but very useful indeed. I'm also interested. Um, any <laughs> further? Yes, please. Yes, I would be interested uh, whether you think these new ways of, so of uh, teaching people jobs can be scaled enough 
uh, to help alleviate the situations of regions which will be if impacted a lot by the transition, for example, regions uh, reliant on mining, coal mining. Do you think that's a possible way to help those regions? Oof. Okay, so these are two very tough questions. Let me recap them for you. Um, first of all, how can we bring, you wanna start? So how can we have a global view and how can we make sure that these opportunities are relevant also for you know, industry, mm -hmm. carbon producing industry, the heavy regions, uh, how can we actually transition? Yes, thank you for these really good uh, questions. And I would like to say that, so these COVID projects, they actually really combine these things. So it's really about a regional approach to really look at the different regions that are involved and see what their problem is, what their need for change is, but then also bringing, up, bringing it up on an on a international scale, on a global scale, and also outside of the European Union. So actually all kind of um, results that are being developed in these, in these projects, they are available for free, open source for everyone. And that's actually a big, um, a big focus that the project not only serves itself, but also that we, we then uh, disseminate and transfer the material, the new solutions that we have come up with to the outside world. So really on a, on a, on a big scale and yeah, to have the focus of the region, but also um, the broader focus. And I just want to mention that you have heard about two COVID projects today, but there are currently, I think, 20 projects and new projects have just been granted. So it's an ongoing initiative of the, of the Commission, of the European Commission. So there will be, I think, 100 COVIDs in the next uh, few years. So it's a, it's a, uh, thing that just started, let's say, in the past years, and it's growing. So, yeah, keep this in mind. Um, if I'm allowed, I would like to state something. Um, when we speak about uh, going green or making uh, big changes, uh, it sometimes seems uh, impossible, and it doesn't seem very feasible. Uh, because one might think how, how could industry, industries possibly uh, change the way they operate? How are they going to proceed to that? And uh, I really want you to have in mind that it's actually the consumers that set the trends. It's all up to the consumers, because if there's no demand, there's, then there's not going to be any making. If consumers change habits and move away from set, certain habits and start demanding from uh, uh, the market different things, then industries are going to be um, forced into working that way if they still want to make a profit. And that's somehow how changes come. But it firstly comes from changing our own habits as consumers, firstly and uh, mostly. That's what I want you to have in mind. And um, Melanie said that, uh, Pina, sorry, um, there are things that you can take away from, uh, from the AI event. Um, and I want you to have something in hand from the AI event. So I'm going to ask you, does anyone have any opinion on what exactly this is? Can someone answer? <laughs> yeah, go on. It's some kind of yarn, probably. Yeah, it is. Do you like the color of it? Yeah. Do you have any idea how this was painted? I hope it talks about something sustainable or not something Yeah, chemical. it was actually painted with chamomile root. A plant helped to paint this, yeah. So let's see who takes that home. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's go with the next one. This one, who wants this? Okay, I'm not gonna ask what was used to paint this one because actually I don't even remember the name of this plant. It's something similar to the Greek olive oil, but there you go, Pina, you can toss it away. Okay, bouquet style, okay, bridal style. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. And I'm pretty sure that there's absolutely no chance someone finds out or guesses what plant was used to color this little one. Does anyone have any idea? Take a wild guess, go on. Is it cocoa plant? No, you know what this is? It's strawberry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I will toss this one. Can I, can I have the honor of doing this? Okay, so thank you all. <laughs> it makes sense just to do the front. Maybe on my side, very quickly, to also reply to the question about the green skills uh, for outside the European Union. Uh, beyond what uh, the colleagues have explained about the centers of vocational excellence, they have explained it very, very well. Under Erasmus Plus, we work in other cooperation projects with, within the European Union, but also with the countries outside. And we really want to have a kind of cooperation that is mutually beneficial but are beneficially for, all the, for uh, both parties, for all parties, so that everybody can improve their uh, education and training systems and the green skills, but also all the skills. Because it's, as it has been said, it's not only a question of one region in the world, it's a global question. We need to have green skills and sustainability everywhere. And then my last takeaway from the session, I was thinking, you know, when we were seeing you coming in, and I was thinking, yeah, green excellence. Actually, I was thinking we probably didn't have the, the, the full uh, perfect name for our session because I start to think from what also you have explained that excellence can only be green. There cannot be uh, no excellence if you are not taking account of the sustainability, of green, of the environment and all of that, uh, of those uh, challenges. And for me, this is uh, my takeaway for uh, today. Thank you. I only have 30 seconds, but I don't really want to um, bother you with anything more. I have said everything you really need to uh, take home with you. But one last thing I want to do is take another selfie with I you. Don't know what we can do at the end. Oh, we are doing okay. We are doing it at the end. <laughs> the selfie we are doing in um, our <laughs> phone to work yes it's working now so to join again us on the slido um, and help us to create a word cloud um, of what's what were the main takeaways for you today what's the one word that you're gonna leave this room be like buzzing in your head and that word cannot be green if you're <laughs> typing green delete <laughs> anything else that is not green Ah, excellent. <laughs> Sustainable. Oh, I cannot see. Ethical consumption, opportunities, Erasmus Plus, passion, jobs, sustainability, recycle, jobs. Ah, I'm lost. Global view, responsibility, consumer preference for green future, ecology, food waste, vocational education. Oh, wow. This is looking like a beautiful word cloud. Um, I think the, the most interesting thing about this word cloud most likely is that we're going to give it back in the hands of the, of the friends here at the European Commission and hand it over to them and say, OK, now we know you're already a strong partner in making Europe together with the parliament as well, greener, sustainable, and ready to transition to a new era. These are the keywords we want to have when we move on in having that discussion. And I really don't want to keep you much longer, so I'm going to skip my uh, takeaways because I think, let him take a selfie with us? Never, never. <laughs> I have the power of the selfie. <laughs> And I shall never allow, I'm joking. So I will uh, skip my uh, takeaways. I wanted to thank you once more for being with us for this one hour. I really hope you have learned. Don't get ready for clapping. I see you over there. I am not done. <laughs> thank you very much. I hope you did learn something new and you did take 
you, you did get a bit inspired as it is in the spirit of the, of the eye. I just have two reminders for you. So first of all, I wanted to, well, I have to do this because otherwise, so the European Parliament has limited capacity and many people are in the queue for more than an hour to get in. So people are waiting to get in. It's on a basis of one out, one in. So if you don't have an activity in the Parliament, please do not stick around for too long. Consider going to the I village and exploring out there and give the opportunity to someone else to come into the, the parliament. Secondly, do not forget to tag um, the, uh, the EPI and use the hashtag I2023 on your posts on social media. Um, and two last things, um, you can always share your ideas, even from today's session on uh, um, youthideas.eu or in the I2023 IDEA Hub around here. And don't forget that next year is a crucial year for Europe. What year is it next year? <laughs> Yay! So next year is election year. So um, sign up for, well, first of all, consider running for the elections. If you cannot run, consider voting for the elections. If you cannot vote, consider asking someone to adopt the, your vote. Uh, otherwise, can come to me, I can adopt your vote if I like it. Um, and then uh, don't forget to sign up to together.eu to participate as much as possible in the, globe, in the community that is created online. And now it's time for a selfie. So whoever wants to be in the selfie, please try to come towards the center of the room so we can take a selfie all together. And if you cannot, if you don't want to be in the selfie, you're very welcome to leave. Now it's your time to shine. Bye, Martin. <laughs>